good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of the distinguished participants who have joined us from many different countries and time zones to take part in this four week virtual academic program on enhancing security and justice coordination to counter transnational organized crime. My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead for this program. We are delighted to have over 65 of you from different countries in Central, Northern, and Eastern Africa participating in this program. And although we can't all see each other today, let me express my thanks to each of you who, have, who has joined us for this virtual program. I hope you will be able to use plenary sessions like this one, as well as weekly discussion groups to get to know each other and to exchange practical knowledge and experiences with one another. These exchanges could be useful because you represent quite a few different countries from across the continent, and you have a variety of experiences in the security and justice sectors, um, and you come from military and civilian backgrounds. On the virtual dais with me, we have Ms. Kate Omquist Knopf, the director of the Africa Center, Dr. Luca Kohl, academic dean at the Africa Center, and soon to be the moderator of this plenary session, uh, as well as Mr. Martin Ailey, who is technical coordinator of the ENACT program, who will also be on the panel. Let me turn it over first to uh, Ms. Knopf uh, for an overview of the Africa Center. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Kat, and good day to all of our colleagues who are joining us for this uh, program. We're so excited to, to have you with us. Uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us uh, today and for the coming weeks. Uh, just a brief word about the Africa Center for Strategic Studies for those who are new to us. Um, we serve as a forum for research, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a, a regional center and academic center of the U.S. Department of Defense based at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Now, our mission of advancing African security uh, includes expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Uh, and this mission uh, that we've taken uh, has, revolves around the generation and dissemination of knowledge uh, through uh, our three uh, main pillars. Uh, these are our academic programs, uh, our research, uh, and our engagement. And we generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges, such as you all will be discussing this week and in the weeks to come. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. Uh, and we hope that doing by doing this, we uh, get to know each other, uh, build relationships with each other, uh, and then we seek to maintain these relationships through our alumni community chapters, uh, which we have in many of your countries and uh, about which you will hear more before our program concludes. Uh, and uh, our many uh, uh, follow on programs uh, that we have for alumni, uh, which we will be inviting all of you to join uh, following this uh, virtual academic program. Um, uh, we hope uh, soon a bilateral interaction uh, when we can once again uh, resume traveling to see you all in person. Uh, and of course, ongoing dialogue between participants, faculty, and staff. Uh, these are ways that uh, we seek to continue to engage uh, even beyond uh, uh, our formal programs. The dialogue that we can have through all of these different uh, channels and uh, uh, types of interaction, uh, we believe uh, uh, best infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis such as each of you bring uh, to the discussion. Uh, this provides an opportunity for all of us for continued learning and to, to catalyze concrete actions. The mission of the Africa Center is guided by our vision, uh, which is to advance security for all Africans championed by effective institutions accountable to their citizens. And this vision, we believe, encompasses the official goal of the African Union to end organized armed violence on the continent and connects it to the United States' fundamental tenets of democratically governed civilian-led security sector institutions capable of delivering safety and security for it, all citizens. We believe accountability to citizens is an important element of our vision as it reinforces the point that in order to be effective, 
strong, the security institutions must just not be strong, uh, but also be responsive to and protective of the rights of citizens. So by engaging together, uh, African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional and international partners, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. And so we hope that you will take the opportunity that this program provides uh, to uh, engage uh, across the security and justice sectors uh, on this very important topic of how to counter transnational organized crime. Uh, I hope that you will participate actively in the discussion groups. As Dr. Kelly said, these are an important component uh, of how the program is constructed and uh, vital so that we can all learn from each other. Uh, and we hope that you will stay connected and engaged with us uh, even beyond these four weeks. Uh, so thank you very much, Kat. Back to you. Thank you, Kate. Before we start today's panel, I want to say just a few words about the program as a whole, which is just one part of the Africa Center's growing line of work on countering transnational organized crime in Africa. In early 2020, we held an initial multinational seminar on this subject with participants from 18 different African countries, and we all went to Niamey, Niger, to discuss generally the drivers and the consequences of different forms of transnational organized crime in Africa, as well as African security and justice sector responses to crime. And it was at this meeting where we determined with colleagues in Afri various African security and justice sectors that it could be useful to have some more practical exchanges, specifically about the subject of coordination across different parts of the security and the justice sectors um, and other sectors involved in countering transnational organized crime. So we began 2021 by holding a seminar on security and justice coordination, much like this one, but it focused on Western and Southern African countries in ECOWAS and SADC regions. And we have posted on the program website, the executive summary from that seminar for this program, so that if you are interested, you can read it in French or in English and see what your colleagues from those regions were learning together and discussing. And it, we will, of course, be interested to see uh, what those of us gathered here for the present program conclude on the basis of your experiences and your work in Central Africa, Northern Africa, and uh, Eastern Africa and the Horn. So we encourage you to share your ideas, knowledge, and experience in this forum and to reflect on what you have found to be good practices, lessons learned, ongoing challenges that your countries or your regions are encountering as you are seeking to address different forms of transnational organized crime. Uh, we know that countering crime often requires joint actions by military law enforcement and justice officials, among others, and to mitigate crime and deal with the factors that may enable it, coordination needs to be based on careful design, implementation, and planning across agencies and ministries within a country. Frequently also, the state officials engaged in this kind of coordination will also need to work with regional and continental bodies that link security and justice officials in one country to security and justice officials in another. So needless to say, coordination is a complex and difficult endeavor. This is true whether we're focusing specifically on security and justice sectors or on how security and justice, justice aspects of coordination may fit into even broader cross-sectoral efforts to address illicit trade and organized crime. There are a couple of different reasons why coordination is a challenging issue. One reason is that criminal networks in Africa are quickly adapting to African states' own efforts to counter transnational organized crime. So high level actors in a criminal network could strategically engage multiple markets. And once those networks, and, and those networks may also change at any given moment where and how they work in order to evade being detected uh, or punished or apprehended. So to build state resilience to transnational organized crime, Security and justice officials need to anticipate these possibilities for criminal adaptations and then use all the tools that they can to coordinate their requisite actions. Coordination can also be challenging for officials because they may need to keep up with trends related to multiple types of organized crime, even if they specialize in just one type themselves. So in some cases, the officials who are coordinating to address one form of transnational crime, say drug trafficking, for example, may confront certain criminal actors who are also involved in other types of transnational organized crime, whether we are talking about arms trafficking, uh, timber trafficking, human smuggling, or something else. 
And in other cases, the criminal actors involved in various types of crime may be different actors, but they might all be exploiting the same pockets of corruption in government, or they may all be using common transit routes that are worth focusing on in a coordinated way. So even officials who are coordinating with colleagues to respond to one specific form of transnational organized crime may also need to understand how that form of crime fits into the broader threat landscape in order to effectively dismantle criminal networks. And finally, there's some citizen security considerations related to security and justice coordination. And I argue that it would be a mistake to see these as complicating factors, um, but it's more of an opportunity um, to consider. So ensuring a citizen-centered dimension to security and justice coordination actually has the potential to improve state and societal resilience to transnational organized crime in the long run. And so the success of responses that African states pursue are influenced by development and governance issues that citizens care about in addition to their security. So for instance, factors like local livelihoods and people's access to government services can affect how susceptible people might be to being employed in parts of the economy that are connected to transnational organized crime. Another factor that matters is whether people perceive their states and the laws that their states are making to be legitimate. And so security and justice officials who are working hard on interagency and cross-border coordination to address transnational organized crime also have an interest in building trusting and collaborative relationships with citizens and communities so as to address some of these enabling factors in ways that are responsive to people's um, experiences and needs and perspectives. So ultimately, I will end here by saying coordination has the potential to facilitate effective cooperation for achieving national security goals, including those your countries and regions may have in relation to countering or preventing transnational organized crime. And we hope in this seminar to touch upon some of the strategic policy and technical elements that can help to realize that potential. We're also acknowledging and probably will discuss further in the discussion groups that there are also contextual, organizational, and even human elements of coordination that can enable or constrain how well or how easily it plays out. So hopefully our exchanges uh, between all of you, the experts and the leaders in this program, will advance our collective learning on how to harness this potential of security and justice coordination to counter and prevent transnational organized crime. With that, um, let me just briefly uh, touch upon the program objectives and then we'll turn it over to Luca who will moderate the first panel. For the overall program, we are hoping to facilitate greater understanding of the range of current initiatives that are underway in Central, Northern, and Eastern Africa to strengthen security and justice sector coordination to counter transnational organized crime. We hope to facilitate a more assessment of how well current coordination efforts fit into regional, national, and local level strategies and approaches to countering crime. And we hope to facilitate good comparisons of your different experiences with military, law enforcement, and judicial coordination to counter crime within and across country borders and through a lens that is sensitive to gender, youth, and politically marginalized groups that may be uh, particularly affected by transnational organized crime. I encourage you as we move through the four weeks of the program to please also visit the program website. The link will be pasted in the chat and has also been emailed to you. You can find information there about the speakers invited to the, each plenary session and the syllabus is also on the website in French and in English. It is very important to look at as you prepare for each week of the seminar because it introduces each topic at hand. It suggests a few recommended readings on the topic and it designates three or four questions that all participants will be asked to respond to in the discussion group each week. So the syllabus can very much help you prepare in advance for the discussion groups that will happen each Wednesday. We will begin the seminar today by talking about how security justice coordination can help to build resilience to transnational organized crime. And the subsequent three weeks of the seminar will look at practical insights on three different aspects of coordination interagency and interministerial coordination uh, on the national level, cross-border coordination between different countries, security and justice officials on the regional and continental and inter-regional levels, 
and coordination efforts that are rooted in local citizen and community-based approaches to dealing with transnational organized crime. Finally, after each week's plenary session, like we have here today, there will be a discussion group on the very same topic that Wednesday. And we hope to mix people from different countries and regions together. And there we will follow strict non-attribution rules. So we hope that this will provide useful opportunities to exchange lessons learned on some of these topics. There are quite a few friendships that get built in seminars like these. Uh, we hope that will happen, uh, although we are um, over Zoom. Um, and there are even WhatsApp groups that form sometimes amongst participants as they get to know each other here. So we encourage you to explore these options as they make sense for you. With that, I think we are ready to start the first plenary session. And so I will turn the moderation duties over to Dr. Luca Cole. Uh, Akkad, thank you very much for the um, such elaborate background for this program and, and the objectives of this program. As you mentioned, this is one of the very um, growing uh, uh, academic program, but highly demanded and actually is a um, attestation of how we should respond to the needs on the continent. And so thank you very much for such a back background. This session, the way we would like to start with this session is to focus on, as the title is showing, building resilience to transnational organized crime through security justice coordination. And and and, and Kat mentioned it very well. So before I, I introduce the panelists for this session, uh, let me share with you what do we intend to achieve uh, from this session. One, we would like to assess transnational organized crime actors, markets, and resilient based on political economy approaches and the INACT organized crime index. Uh, the second one is to understand why and how security justice coordination is an important element of African state resilience to transnational organized crime, as well as why coordination must be linked to a broader a strategy of addressing the security, development, and governance factors that indeed drive the transnational organized crime. Last but not least, uh, to review the three strategic aspects of security justice coordination that the seminar will cover, particularly the cross-border coordination, interagency coordination, an inclusive citizen and community approaches to coordination. And this, as Kat mentioned, these are the theme that will, will, will guide us through the entire program. So I am pleased really to welcome uh, uh, two season experts on the issues that we have raised on the transnational organized crime and coordination and resilience. Who will really start our conversation? about security justice coordination and the factors that, and the factors affecting African state and society resilient to transnational organized crime, particularly in Central, Eastern and Northern Africa. Since you have that bios, I will only highlight some of the relevant expertise and experiences. Let me start first with Mr. Martin Ewe. He is, the technical coordinator of the INACT project at the Institute for Security Studies in South Africa. With this position, uh, Martin coordinates and manages the five regional organized crime observatories in Africa that, in Africa that provide research analysis and recommendation about transnational organized crime that inform indeed the organized crime index that's going to be the focus of our session today. So he's really, there's no other best person like Martin to talk about this organized crime index on the continent. So thank you very much, uh, Martin, for being with us. He did terrorism research for Institute for Security Studies in South Africa. He also worked at the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons in the head. Welcome, Martin, and we are so happy having you today. And the second panelist, as she introduced herself, is my colleague, uh, Catherine Kelly, and, and she's Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law at the Africa Center. She's a faculty lead of this program, 
on countering transnational organized crime in Africa. And she's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in the U.S. She previously worked as an advisor at the, Afri at the American Bar Association. She is the author of a book on party competition in Senegal. And she earned her PhD in government from Harvard University. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Kat, for being with us. Let me start our conversation first, maybe for about seven minutes with Martin. Uh, Martin, given your leading role in the Inact Organized Crime Index in Africa, can you briefly and in a simple way introduce us to this important index? And follow to that one, uh, please emphasize or touch upon how the index classifies criminal actors, criminal markets, vulnerability and resilient factors, as well as how coordination fits into these into the, in the picture. Plus, is it possible to show us how is it useful tool for security and justice practitioner seeking to coordinate, respond to transnational organized crime? Martin, you're most welcome within seven minutes, please. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Kyle. Let me also, sorry, uh, <laughs> Luca. Um, let me also take this uh, opportunity uh, really uh, on behalf of the Institute for Security Studies and the INAC project in particular uh, to thank uh, the Africa Center for the excellent work that they have been doing, particularly in promoting this very important tool, uh, the index um, and the issue of transnational organized crime, which we believe that it's a critical issue in Africa that has been uh, less understood by the majority of those who are confronting it. Uh, and therefore, we are really happy uh, to be associated uh, with, this, uh, with this program. The INACT uh, uh, project is, um, is a project at the Institute, it's a project funded by the European Union, um, which is implemented by a consortium of uh, three partners, uh, the Institute for Security Studies, which is the leading partner. We also have Interpol, and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, this is a project that was launched in 2017, um, and we have just completed the first phase of the project and uh, expecting to start the second phase uh, in 2022. Um, the INACT Organized Crime Index is a very dynamic uh, policy tool, uh, which, has, which was launched in September 2019. Uh, we are about to launch the second iteration of the index. Uh, the global version of the index was launched uh, three weeks ago, and we are about to, to launch the Africa uh, version of the index, which we hope uh, will happen uh, in the first week of uh, November or the second week of November. Uh, the purpose of the index uh, uh, is to offer uh, a tool through which we could truly measure the magnitude, trends, and characterization of uh, organized crime in Africa. It is therefore a tool for policymakers and researchers to give us in-depth knowledge of the makers and breakers of organized crime in Africa. Unlike most indices of this nature, the Inact Organized Crime Index brings the concept of criminality and resilience together to offer a nuanced model that examines the interplay and convergence of criminality, actors, and resilience. In a nutshell, the index measures fragility and resilience. The fragility indicators measure the prevalence of organized crime. They comprise 10 criminal markets, and four main categories of criminal actors or the perpetrators of organized crime. And this includes everyone in the value chain. The criminal markets include human trafficking, human smuggling, arms trafficking, flora crimes, which includes illicit logging and trafficking of plant species. The fauna crimes, which include wildlife crimes, 
and many others. We also have non-renewable resource crimes, which include illegal mining, trafficking of uh, uh, petrol and other goods. The indicators also include heroin trade, cocaine trade, cannabis trade, and synthetic drug trade. The criminal actors include mafia style groups, criminal networks, state embedded actors, and foreign actors. Resilience, which is the other key pillar of the index, measures the preparedness of government or state to deal with organized crime of the aforementioned criminal market. It measures actions, policies, and institutions in place. It also examines the systems or governance structures in place for managing the problem at various levels. In this context, the index also pays attention to the type of governance approach or system. One of the major findings for this year uh, iteration of the index is that democratic systems tend to have more resilience than other forms of government. The 12 re resilience indicators include national policies and laws, international cooperation, territorial integrity, non-state actors, law enforcement, political leadership and governance, anti-money laundering, economic regulatory environment, judici judicial system and detention, government transparency and accountability. We also have prevention and victim and witness support as indicators. These are the 12 indicators that the index uses to measure resilience in state. The development of the index encompassed over 3,000 academic publications, 1,300 policy reports, 8,000 news articles, and more than 200 experts from across the continent who contributed to the index at various levels. For each country that was considered, there were a range of expertise, experts from within that country that debated the various facets of the index in that country, including the rankings, of course, of the criminality and the resilience segment. The index is first and foremost a policy tool to guide practitioners develop more targeted and tailored responses. There is no need to spend valuable and scarce resources in developing a framework or institutions to respond to non-renewable resource crimes if your country does not have such resources. And therefore the index, the index comes in here to be able to guide countries to channel resources towards where they are more needed. We also realize that the responses to organized crime in Africa is fragmented and the actors were, were not talking to each other, meaning that the state actors that are dealing with organized crime do not talk to each other, they do not communicate. For example, drug law enforcement units focus only on themselves and communicating among themselves. And those dealing with wildlife crime, for example, only talk to themselves also. The silos approach proved very, very ineffective. And therefore uh, that motivated the idea of developing the index. The response to organized crime never reflected the complex convergence that we see with criminal actors and networks. With the index, we see why the different agencies need to work together. This requirement for interagency cooperation 
is well provided under the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, the Palermo, the Palermo Convention. This explains why one of the resilience indicators is about international cooperation. You cannot fight organized crime in isolation. Even agencies dealing with terrorism now have to worry about organized crime. The index helps you to locate and understand what crimes are element of the crime terror nexus. If you allow me, uh, moderator, I will just spend a minute to wrap up my, uh, my initial remarks with a summary of the key findings of the global index, which I hope will also inform our Africa version, which is still to come out in November. The, one of the most critical findings is that more than three quarter of the world's population live in countries with high levels of criminality and in countries with low resilience to organized crime. This is a serious finding, meaning that most of the world population live in conditions of organized crime, uh, meaning that there is high level of vulnerability. We also found that Asia has the highest levels of criminality, followed by Africa, then Americas, Europe, and Oceania in that order. If I were to ask many of you, which is the, uh, the country the most affected by organized crime, I'm sure um, quite a significant number of you will say Africa. But here we are saying that Asia is the most affected country, uh, uh, continent, sorry, uh, with the highest levels of criminality. The third finding of the index is that human trafficking is the most pervasive of all criminal markets uh, globally, followed by cannabis trade, arms trafficking, and human smuggling. We also found that democracies have higher levels of resilience to criminality than authoritarian state or other forms of government. We also found that state actors are the most dominant agent in facilitating illicit economies and inhabiting resilience to transnational organized crime. Corruption, of course, which is a key driver of the level of resilience um, is actually the vehicle for these state embedded actors. Many countries, uh, or the sixth uh, category is that many countries in the world, or many countries where you have this high level of transnational organized crime are countries in conflict and fragile states which experience acute vulnerability to transnational organized crime. Uh, some of these countries include the Democratic Republic of Congo, Colombia, Myanmar, Mexico, Nigeria, and Iran. I would like to leave it here, uh, moderator, and hopefully expand my thoughts uh, as we proceed uh, with the webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah, Martin, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for such a very uh, powerful findings. But for us in the Africa Center, we opted to have these to use this index because of our conviction, the quality of the data generated from this index. And as Martin mentioned, it is not only mapping the magnitude of the criminality on the continent, but indeed the level of response uh, to, this, to this criminality in terms of the resilience. And uh, so thank you very much, uh, Martin. And in fact, it is actually also affirming our focus that the evidence-based approach or any response to the uh, to the threats facing the continent. So this is will come later on the issue of strategies, and any development strategy you needed to it should be informed by reliable information. As Martin mentioned, it is an opportunity for the the uh, African countries to use this index to use them as your own in order to inform your decision making process and also in terms of the response. Maybe Martin, I will come later on also the. Uh, the, uh, the issue of the relevance of this index for the, uh, for the coordination in response to the transnational organized crime. 
But let me go with the second question about the, uh, the index itself. Uh, and I think you indicated to a certain degree. Uh, and the, it's, it's about what are the criminality and resilient challenges that countries in the central, northern, and eastern Africa and the whole are currently facing. And it would be good also to the, the ladies on to the relevance of this index for the coordination in responding to the transnational organized crime. Maybe in seven minutes, Martin, I'll come. Thank you. Thank you. I will try to. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, our work uh, has really been evidence based. Uh, we cannot do this um, through a purely academic approach. Uh, we understand that policies, uh, in order for them to be effective, need to be evidence based. And therefore, we are promoting that evidence based approach. The index itself, it's uh, um, evidence of that evidence based uh, approach that we are promoting. Now, in order to, to really substantiate or to drive this evidence-based approach, the INAC project is designed around regional organized crime observatories, which I think Kat mentioned uh, in her opening remarks. Now, these observatories, for us, are the, the, the research arms. They are the, also the arm for analysis because they are based in the regions, they are based where the issues are taking place. Um, we am, for example, in Pretoria, I cannot claim to know exactly what is happening in West Africa and provide the kind of analysis that a West African who is on the ground will provide. And therefore we take this into consideration when we are analyzing the index, we do collect uh, analysis and perspective from quite a range of um, uh, experts, uh, but we also make sure that on the ground, uh, those who are closest to the issue can provide uh, um, uh, a very authoritative analysis. And our regional organized crime observatories, uh, which are manned by um, uh, senior researchers and regional coordinators uh, based uh, in the five regions, we have observatories in, in West Africa, uh, which serves also for Central Africa. We have observatory in, in Kenya, which, uh, which is for East Africa region based in Nairobi. We have an observatory uh, in Addis Ababa, which uh, looks after the Horn of Africa and the situation uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, we also have an index for North Africa, which deals with the, uh, the, 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 the situation in that, in that region. So therefore, um, whatever we do, uh, in terms of updating the index or enriching the work of INAC um, is really based on that index. And I also want to refer you and probably your, uh, uh, the participant to the, to the pool of resources that INAC uh, has produced, which is found on our website. Uh, in the four years of our existence, we've produced over 400 written materials, uh, we, which include continental report, um, research report, specific policy briefs addressing specific issues, uh, and of course, a, a wide range of trend report and observatory uh, uh, pieces. So this uh, information, this report are all available on our web website uh, to, be, to be downloaded uh, free of charge. The ROCOs also offer a framework for early warning. Uh, the differences in the issues detected across the region reflect the diversity of organized crime uh, issues across our continent. The index has done an excellent job in mapping out some of these uh, crimes. The index offers an excellent uh, quadrant uh, in which we can place or group African countries in four broad trends. Thank you very much. So as you can see, there are four main trends of uh, what we can say, uh, trends in how organized crime interact with resilience in Africa. The first is a, a list of countries, as you can see, a list of countries exhibiting high resilience and high criminality. This is not an ideal situation, but it is manageable because you have countries that have uh, uh, resilience which can counter the, 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 the criminality uh, challenge. Uh, but most often uh, other factors such as corruption may continue to drive uh, organized crime to maintain this very uh, high level. 
Uh, and a, a good example of this kind of countries uh, include uh, South Africa and Nigeria. The second trend in the quadrant is a list of countries with low resilience and high criminality. This reflects conventional wisdom that high criminality lowers resilience and vice versa. The focus of these countries should be to strengthen resilience while combating uh, criminal actors. This is a popular trend where many African countries fit into. We have quite a bulk of uh, African countries that you can see there in, uh, in red, which have very low resilience and very high criminality. Uh, these countries uh, need to focus on combating criminality while increasing the level of uh, resilience. What we see in many of these countries um, is that uh, they are mostly countries, uh, countries with conflict, instability, they lack infrastructures, they have very poor governance structures, and very weak institutions. The third category of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this uh, um, uh, train is a group of countries with high resilience and low criminality. These are the, the blue eye, or I would say the green eye boys around. Um, you can see that uh, this is uh, the ideal situation to be in. Uh, they seem to have the situation under control. Uh, such countries include, as you can see on the map, the green uh, countries, uh, Namibia, Botswana, Senegal, Morocco, Tunisia, and Ethiopia. The fourth category of countries include states with resilience, with low resilience and low criminality. I always say this is uh, double jeopardy because the low resilience could be very deceiving uh, for the countries to think that uh, they have the situation under control, but they are extremely vulnerable and the situation could uh, quickly deteriorate into a case where um, criminality become extremely high, pushing them to the, uh, the, the second category that uh, we talked about. The focus of such countries should be to strengthen resilience through increased capacity to institutions, putting in place a robust policy and legislative framework. They may also need to consider uh, strengthening governance, combating corruption, and showing more leadership and international cooperation. Another major finding of the index is that increased civil society participation in processes could be a significant factor to boost resilience. And therefore, such countries, uh, we've also found that uh, re, um, the participation of civil society is extremely low, um, where governance um, is a very uh, uh, excluded factor for the few. It is therefore important to note that the principle of inclusiveness, good governance, and effective international and interagency coordination are underpinned by uh, underpin the index, particularly the resilience pillar of the index. The 2019 regional trends show that criminality is highest in East Africa with a score of 5.5, followed by West Africa, which has a score of just over five. The continental average is 4.97. North Africa and Southern Africa have almost the same level of criminality. The Southern Africa showing upper trends. The criminality index for Central Africa is slightly below the continental average. North Africa, Southern Africa, and West Africa have almost the same level of resilience, which is higher than the continental average of 3.86. Resilience is lowest in Central Africa, very deceiving, of course followed by East Africa, both of which are below continental average. The lowest indicator of resilience in Africa is victim and witness support, meaning that many of our countries do not establish witness, uh, witness protection programs 
where in most cases we see witnesses being killed and it reflect the whole system of the criminal justice to be extremely weak. If you have a weak criminal justice system, you cannot fight transnational organized crime. And therefore, this witness protection program is a key indicator of the kind of criminal justice system that you have uh, in place. The most prevalent criminal market in Africa is human trafficking with a score of 5.36. We've also seen with the global index that human trafficking is the most prevalent criminality across the world. This is followed by fauna crimes with 5.31, arms trafficking with 5.24, and human trafficking, human smuggling with 4.47. We hope we are looking at the dynamics of the second iteration of the index, uh, how these factors play out, what have been the changes. I can tell you they are already uh, quite uh, uh, significant uh, changes in some of this area. But what we, the, a general trend that we make, that we observe in the, uh, 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 the second iteration of the index to give you, you know, something to look forward to the index is that the changes have been very insignificant in many areas. The most prevalent criminal actor is uh, the criminal network category followed by state embedded actors and foreign actors. Mafia style groups are the least prevalent of the four actor categories across the country. And what this tells us is that um, our community most often is not as organized. Um, again, uh, many of these areas, we can spend the whole day talking about um, this specific area of the index, uh, but I look forward to the question, the discussion, where I can further expand on many of these areas that I've highlighted. I thank you very much. Well, well thank you very much, Martin. And uh, yes, some of the few things that I want to, to highlight what, <clears throat> what Martin said is this, this index, what is good with it is that you can be able to aggregate them from the national to the regional to the continental level. So it's a very important tool. And even for the participants, you'll be able to look at your country with these indexes in terms of the criminality and in terms of the uh, of the resilient and especially the resilient part and what is very important from this index is that it, it is it shows the importance of a coordination based on the information that's available how much people can countries can gain by sharing some of this information in order to work together transnational organized crime is about collective work and this collective work cannot happen unless you have these wells of the information that needed to be shared and, and used and acted upon. And I think that's a very, a very important, but very important also, very clear for the central, northern and eastern Africa and the whole, indeed the whole of Africa, is that it has a very low level of resilience and a high level of, uh, of, 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 of uh, criminality. Yes. And I think this is a very a pattern that is very important. And as Martin mentioned, one of the challenges facing these countries, and especially if you take the Horn of Africa, the issues of governance is becoming a very important area. I think we are seeing aggression in the governance in some of these countries where we have a very high prevalence of the uh, of the criminality. And I think the point raised by Martin that there is. Uh, countries, a democratic government, uh, a, a democratic government, they tend to have a very low level of resilience. And one is not surprised. It is because always the, the uh, democratic government, they tend to have a credible and accountable decisions. These are government that they adhere to the needs of the citizen. As Kate, I mean, um, Kate mentioned, the human centered approach to the security. So, really, thank you very much, Martin, for such a lovely. And for me, I think the, uh, there are more information on the Organized Crime Index report. Please, I really ask you to read this report. Because this, this report is going to constitute a very important resource and to inform all our, our discussion in the subsequent uh, session. Uh, so really, I encourage you to read this report. And if you can spend some of the time for your country, you will see a wealth of information, as Martin mentioned. Look at the number of material used in order to generate this index. And these are the materials that should be resolved to you in your own country. And uh, so I encourage you really to read this, uh, uh, this, uh, the report that Martin uh, talked about. L let me now turn to, to Kat. Uh, Kat, let me, let, as a faculty lead of this program, 
in your opinion, why is security justice coordination critical to counter transnational organized crime uh, uh, for African state in their attempt to build a resilient to transnational organized crime? And if possible, please define in a simple way what is coordination <laughs> and, and explain its significance and discuss its links to resilient uh, factors on the organized crime index. Um, maybe within six minutes, uh, Kat, yes. I would appreciate that one. That sounds good. Well, for if, to start with definitions, perhaps, coordination in general, um, I would define as the process of trying to make different parts of a system and the various organizations that are part of that system work together more effectively in service of a goal. And so if you look at public policy research on this, it shows that when coordination is done well, it can help to minimize competition and enhance complementarity among the different actors and institutions that are working together towards a particular goal. Coordination is more likely to succeed if it's based on clear definitions of the roles and responsibilities that different actors uh, might have as they're working together. And coordination in general is important because it has the potential when it's done well to help solve long-term problems that no single institution or agency or even single country could deal with as well by themselves. And of course, coordination is not a new idea. Uh, many of you in this room have already done work trying to develop or refine uh, how security and justice actors in particular are dealing together with the different actors who are perpetrating transnational organized crime. Um, and even when we have some of these tools in place, there are bureaucratic or relational or human elements that can make this still a very challenging process. And so I think that's one reason we're gathered here over the next four weeks to discuss with each other. Um, for example, to some extent, it could be desirable for state officials to specialize in different aspects of transnational organized crime. As Martin said earlier, we have uh, drug trafficking focused authorities and human trafficking focused special units, for example, that are working on particular parts of this. And having this kind of specialization can make responses to each aspect of crime faster, more well-informed, uh, and, and, and that can be a very good thing. At the same time, it might also be helpful to have some degree of overlap in different agencies or ministries or countries work on crime. That's a way of ensuring that the approach across different entities that are involved in coordination is more broadly coherent. So striking an appropriate balance between specialization and overlap is just one example of a challenge that also needs to be addressed with evidence um, based on context from context to context, the solution might be different. Um, and so um, that's a little bit um, definitionally on coordination and on why it's an important potential tool here uh, for dealing with transnational organized crime. Um, in terms of the ENACT index, this is a tool that can shed light on different possible components of state responses to crime on the basis of data and evidence. Um, so knowing how pervasive each kind of criminality is in your own country um, can help policymakers assess which markets to prioritize and how to allocate resources. Similarly, looking at where a country is already strongest or weakest on the 12 resilience indicators could help us identify which sectors or which kinds of activities may need more or less emphasis when we're building or developing or refining any sort of coordinated response effort. So security and justice coordination can be a useful tool that helps leaders, institutions, systems, and citizens deal with transnational organized crime in ways that mitigate harm and reduce their countries or their regions future vulnerabilities to it. In other words, security justice coordination has great potential to contribute to resilience, I think. And the index has suggested these 12 factors that are likely to affect African state and societal resilience to transnational organized crime. Martin ran through them. Um, I'll run through the list again quickly because just to remind you, but you know, political leadership, government transparency and accountability matters, international cooperation, as well as national policies and laws, law enforcement and judicial capacity, anti-money laundering efforts, victim and witness support, prevention and civil society involvement um, in response, as well as border security, all play in um, as potential ways to build resilience. And security justice coordination relates to quite a few of these different resilience factors. So just to give a few examples, 
sometimes the resilience factors that we're talking about here affect potential for coordination. So for example, the success of coordination certainly depends on law enforcement and justice sector capacities to address specialized issues that relate to transnational organized crime. Um, so law enforcement and justice capacity are two of those resilience factors getting measured on the index. Coordination also plays into national policies and laws. Coordination might be easier or harder depending on what strategies, plans, and legislation provide a framework for security and justice actors to work together. And uh, another point that's easy to make in relation to one of these resilience factors, government transparency and accountability, governments that are more transparent to their citizens are likely to be more trusted and may then have an easier time finding ways to succeed in community and local level coordination on transnational organized crime. And then finally, there are also some ways that these resilience factors affect, um, uh, you know, work the other way around. Coordination can facilitate progress or advancement on a resilience factor. So for instance, on border security and territorial integrity, countries can use coordination across sectors to bring a wide variety of state services to communities and border zones. That might help them address some of these difficulties people in certain communities have in finding, say, alternative livelihoods to organized crime. Um, a coordinated cross-sectoral border management approach here can make security officials and justice officials work on border security more likely to address some of these underlying factors that are enabling transnational organized crime in the first place. So Dr. Luca, those are just a few examples um, that show how coordination cuts across quite a few of these resilience factors on the index. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kat. And uh, I just want to echo one thing, which is very important, what Kat mentioned, that the uh, one of the key elements for the resilient issues of the political leadership. And I, I just want to, to fuck, I mean, to emphasize that all of us here in this workshop, we are leaders of our own. And in your own way, you are a leader. And you can be able to help in improving the resilience level in your country in your own limited way. And as she mentioned, while she defining the, the, uh, the resilience and its importance, I think each of us, we may need to reflect. In one way or another, we have been experiencing this uh, coordination. Uh, in our own countries. And these are some of the experiences that we'd like you really to bring them up uh, during the discussion group. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Kat, for the uh, for at least simplifying to us the concept of coordination and, and its relevance to the issue of resilience and the coordination and, 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 and resilience. Uh, as a follow-up, uh, Kat, can you, just a follow-up question again or two, why do you think the security and justice coordination is important on the cross-border interagency and citizen or community level? And, and what aspects of coordination on each of these three levels do you think that are important for building resilience to transnational organized crime? Maybe within six minutes, Kat, thanks. Yes, Dr. Luca. Well, these three different aspects of coordination that we will be covering in the rest of the, the, the four weeks, each of them are potential tools that could be mutually reinforcing to enhance African states' preparedness to iterate and adapt its responses to criminal networks, which are, um, as we talked about earlier, very adaptable um, and, and are changing where and how they work frequently. Um, so I think we should consider these different kinds of security and justice coordination all potential elements of what we could bring into a response that's seeking to build more um, uh, on the resilience factors um, that Martin has laid out for us. So let me just touch briefly on the three different kinds of coordination we'll be talking about. First, there is interagency or interministerial coordination. And this kind of coordination could include elements of horizontal coordination or vertical coordination. Now, horizontal is what happens between different central government bodies that are responding to transnational organized crime. And vertical coordination is between national and subnational officials within particular security or justice sector agencies, um, and sometimes could also involve civil society actors um, outside of the government hierarchy. And uh, in terms of interagency coordination, there is, of course, no one single right way to configure institutions within a country to facilitate this. 
Sometimes we have offices of the prime minister or the national security advisor taking the lead as coordinating bodies for security and justice. And we will hear a bit more about this next week from some of our speakers. Other times coordination could come about institutionally in other ways. We have seen countries trying to advance interagency coordination by creating special units focused on certain kinds of trafficking or smuggling that combine officials from different parts of the security sector to work together in the everyday. Some other countries have created interministerial committees that are linking um, justice sector focal points to their security sector counterparts across the military, law enforcement, and intelligence. And another um, entity worth mentioning are financial intelligence units here. They have been very useful in different countries for facilitating information sharing, potentially even across other security and justice sector institutions um, in relation to transnational organized criminal dynamics. And because transnational organized crime touches on issues that fall under the responsibility of multiple agencies or ministries, security and justice officials often may need to work with colleagues from other sectors and other entities like customs, forestry, fishing, immigration, et cetera. So we will hear all more about both of these aspects more next week. A second kind of coordination is cross-border coordination between different countries, security and justice actors. And there are so many dimensions to this, continental, regional, interregional, and then even bilateral neighbor to neighbor sort of aspects of this. Continentally, we have the African Union's police cooperation institution, AFRIPOL, which is focused on preventing, detecting, and investigating transnational organized crime um, in coordination with national and regional institutions. Um, it's focused on police. I will also mention here that entities like the African Women's Leadership Network might also be able to meaningfully shape strategy and policy discussions on these issues. Going down to the regional level, of course, we have the regional economic communities, which are highly concerned by nature with coordination. So just last week, for example, we had the annual general meeting of the East African Police Chiefs Cooperation Organization in Kinshasa. And organizations like these are linked to the regional economic communities. They're also linked to Interpol. And they often tend to work with organizations like the UNODC, for example, to coordinate responses to cross-border crime. Um, we see uh, uh, other examples coming out of EGAD with their security sector program focused on um, cross-border trainings and capacity buildings on these issues. On the judicial side, there are mechanisms like the Great Lakes Judicial Cooperation Network that is trying to help prosecutors and central judicial authorities across countries facilitate mutual legal assistance or other informal sorts of information sharing. And then on the neighbor to neighbor level, um, you know, countries sometimes sign memoranda of understanding to facilitate better coordination. Other countries may hold joint permanent commissions between their two the neighboring countries and their countries, ministers of defense and justice and other sectors. And in some places, um, like the border zones in Libya and Tunisia, we see even ad hoc civil society groups and local officials trying to strike informal agreements on illicit trade. Finally, interregional coordination is important here too. Um, for example, across Eastern and Southern Africa, over the years, there have been a series of Usalama operations that have, uh, have been pursued jointly through Interpol. Um, and ECOWAS and the Economic Community of Central African States have also had a really impressive system of interregional coordination on maritime crime that they have set up over the last 10 or so years that we can talk about more as we move through that part of the program. Finally, the third kind of coordination is pretty much state society coordination. Speakers in week four will talk about this based on their own work as practitioners and researchers on the local level. But there are two aspects I would like to highlight here. One is the one important component is having inclusive policy and strategy processes to deal with transnational organized crime, right? Um, state security and justice actors have an interest in formulating policies and strategies that reinforce citizen security and that allow civil society to bring a range of voices into the conversation about this, especially voices of women, youth, people from um, different classes and places um, within a country that might be affected and bringing a range of formal and informal leaders in here um, could be really helpful. 
The second uh, and even more important component of citizen-centered coordination is about how citizens and community leaders themselves take the lead in devising ways to address transnational organized crime. They have already come up with a variety of local dispute resolution or livelihood generation, civic advocacy, or even community-based security provision mechanisms that they're, they're trying to use to address different forms of crime locally. So when a range of local stakeholders stand behind these kinds of endeavors, these two need to be taken seriously in our strategic planning. I'll stop there. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Akkad. And uh, I just want to highlight the points you mentioned, these different mechanism of the coordination. And I think each of you, in one way or another, being engaged in, in such mechanism. And this is the chance for you really to share some of your experiences, whether it's cross border or interagency or, or citizen community levels coordination. Please bring them out and uh, very important to the uh, to, to the uh, lower peer learning and, and exchange of the experiences. Uh, one point I just want to highlight, maybe we'll discuss more on this. What are the critical aspects of coordination that could enhance building resilience to counter transnational organized crime? And besides the normal thing that we have been talking about, the institutions, I think I'd mentioned very important point, the, the centrality of policy and strategy. Uh, this is a very important, uh, a coordination cannot be just from, from nowhere. It must be guided by a strategic direction. And that's why the issue of policy and the strategy is becoming very important in, in making coordination effective. So thank you very much, Kat, for that. Now, let me turn to Martin. Um, maybe the last question. You have mapped out the level of criminality, the level of resilience within the index. Maybe we'll move now for a specific way forward. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what kinds of policy recommendation about coordination does the inact quadrant analysis suggest for countries with different criminality and resilient profiles. And what would be interesting, especially the quadrant with low uh, resilience and high and high criminality. Um, Martin, please welcome, maybe in seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Luca, um, for, for that question. I think, uh, indeed, it's critical. Uh, we can't leave this uh, forum without uh, having a way forward, uh, you know, to bring together uh, what we have been saying and how you package that into policy recommendations. Uh, what I think first is that um, for anyone who is working on uh, organized crime, the index should be your first stop. Uh, get to the index, get to know it, see the different characteristics of the index in your country, see the areas that are affected, from there, you can actually define which unit, which agencies need to work together. Countries should use the index to understand the key organized crimes, the actors uh, and other fragility factors. Uh, most importantly, I think they need to use the index to know the areas of challenges for resilience, as well as to know other countries with similar challenges. Because once you know uh, other countries that are facing similar challenges, you know how to define your cooperation. You know which countries to cooperate with in which area. And you could also share experiences. You know, once you identify those countries, you can share experiences with them. They can tell you how they are dealing with it, uh, the mistakes they've made, the strength of their responses, the achievement that they have made and so on and so forth. That will significantly inform how you move forward in dealing with transnational organized crime. If you don't do that, you will never be able to know which countries to cooperate with and what kind of cooperation you need to, to conduct with that country. Um, we also think that uh, horizontal and vertical coordination need to be improved. Vertical coordination involves the elimination of certain bureaucratic uh, bottlenecks why horizontal coordination involves the elimination of effective, uh, um, uh, sorry, it involves the elimination of competition among agencies. 
uh, because we think that competition among agencies is what sometimes uh, uh, impedes on how countries actually col collaborate and how agencies collaborate with one another. Because most often we all know, I think it is, uh, it is um, a, a fact now that everyone needs coordination, but no one wants to coordinate. Uh, and I think coordination, Kadi, we're talking about it um, as if there, were, there are certain institutions that are charged with this. Yes, they are indeed. But I think we can go beyond that by making coordination a responsibility for each and every uh, stakeholder, for each and every officer, that when you sit in your office, you are an agent of coordination. It shouldn't be the, the, the prerogative of one institution or one individual that is charged with doing this. Once everyone feels that responsibility, I think that we can take coordination forward. And I think this will make a difference in how we, um, we collaborate or we coordinate. The other point I want to mention is the experience of uh, the ISS, the INACT uh, project, um, where we have been helping law enforcement agencies across the continent um, to, to develop um, uh, critical tools, particularly um, uh, policy tools, uh, and also what I will call a, a norm-based approach you know, where we've been able to help countries develop uh, uh, agreements and conventions or protocols to address specific problem area, uh, specific criminal issues where they need to collaborate. I'm saying this, um, uh, referring especially to uh, the work we have done uh, in East Africa in the elaboration of the protocol uh, on combating, preventing, and eliminating um, cattle rustling in East Africa, uh, the so-called Mifugo Protocol, uh, which was adopted uh, last week by the ministers of uh, uh, Eastern uh, Africa. Now this protocol, which I believe is the first in this area, uh, in a, uh, on an issue which affects almost every country on the continent. I have not come across a, con a country in Africa uh, which does not have the problem of cattle rustling. Uh, some call it headers issue, some call it a uh, full and knee problem and so on. But the livestock theft, that's as it is called here in, in Southern Africa, is a major problem across the, the, the continent. But we have not seen any region that has taken the kind of proactive move that is, uh, African countries have done in adopting the Mifugo protocol to bring operational officers together. This is not a political document. This is really a coordination tool. This is really a tool to address uh, uh, coordination on the ground, to address operational issues uh, on the ground. And I think this is the kind of uh, mechanism, the kind of policy tool that we need in order to enhance our work uh, on the ground and also to really deal with coordination because it creates agencies that should actually take coordination forward, even though it is the responsibility of every officer. But there are certain specific agencies which take that responsibility, that accountability. These are agencies that are accountable for coordination. If there is no coordination, these are the agencies that you need to be talking to in order to address a uh, coordination problem. We've, we've also done work with uh, uh, promote inter-regional cooperation, which has been a big problem across Africa where uh, East Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, Northern Africa, there is absolutely nothing in place to bring them together, apart from uh, some of the continental instruments uh, adopted at the level of the African Union. Even that by themselves, the implementation of them on the ground has not been effective, has not been in a way that it has helped to bring different regions together. And therefore, what we are doing now is to increase that uh, inter-regional cooperation. Uh, and we've done this by promoting certain operational agreement, like the one we've done for um, West and Central Africa, which brought together ECOWAS and uh, ECAS uh, together to sign uh, a memorandum of understanding, uh, actually defining areas of cooperation, especially among law enforcement uh, agencies uh, on the ground. That agreement was actually approved by the summit in 2018. 
And then uh, recently, there is also an agreement between uh, East Africa and Central Africa, where they have adopted uh, an agreement uh, between CAPCO, the, the, um, uh, the chiefs of the Committee of Chiefs of Police for Central Africa and the Eastern African Police Chief Co Cooperation Organization for East Africa um, to actually facilitate uh, operational issues on the ground. Uh, these issues include um, how do you deal with a suspect? One country A arrests a suspect and country B wants that suspect. How do you regulate that? The agreement gives you practical procedures in terms of how these countries can solve this problem easily. Uh, it eliminates the political issues we normally have with extradition uh, and really take uh, mutual legal assistance to a new level, um, really based on officer to officer cooperation. I think that's what we need. When they talk to each other, they know exactly how to resolve their problems rather than when they have to pass through ministers, they have to pass through ambassadors in order to deal with practical issues on the ground. It does not only delay the process, but it made it very, very cumbersome uh, on the ground that we do not have any progress in that area. Uh, this agreement also addressed issues of a hot pursuit, which has been a problem uh, in Africa. We have this uh, cross-border uh, um, uh, threat, uh, but yet we don't have cross-border mechanism. We don't have procedures in place to facilitate that cross-border cooperation. These agreements are now facilitating that. We've also taken steps to help regional mechanisms like SADC uh, that we've done recently to adopt regional strategies on transnational organized crime. Now, these are very comprehensive uh, strategies that address not only uh, uh, cooperation issues, but also operational issues on most of the areas. So we use the index to define what are the critical issues of organized crime in this region. And once we define that, we, we map out areas of collaboration, areas of cooperation among the different uh, operational officers um, to look at uh, these issues on daily basis. The SADC uh, strategy really defines, um, I call it a new generation of uh, strategies because it takes it really forward, creating mechanisms that have to collaborate or coordinate activities on daily basis. I think this is the way forward. I think it is how much we are able to promote this kind of co cooperation, both at the inter-regional level, at the inter-agency level, and the inter-country level. Uh, and these are all levels that are critical if we want to take uh, uh, cooperation uh, forward. I thank you, um, uh, moderator. I hope I've not uh, extended uh, your time. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Martin. And, uh... Uh, one, one, one thing, yes, I want to highlight, especially for us, uh, the participants, I think what Martin said is, how can you be able to internalize the index at your level? Really, this is a very important way forward. Look at it, study it, even sometimes adapt it to your own condition, and even you can be able to regenerate it, making your own, and, and, and use it in order to inform the year. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issues of the resilience and the response, but in fact, to inform even the, uh, the, uh, the coordination. I think it is very important. Please look at this index of your country. One thing I think what Martin said, maybe you may need also to compare your country with those countries in the quadrant with high level of resilience and a low level of criminality and look to the, those indicators and look at the coordination mechanism, why these countries are performing well. And this is some of the things maybe among you here, your countries in this quadrant, and you can be able to share some of these experiences. But you also, as individual participants, look to your country, compare your country to some of these countries that are doing well and why. Maybe they are here, you ask them, share with them. I think the, this is a very important recommendation for you internalize, study, know the index, use it effectively for improving resilience in your country, and you can make it, but equally important for the, uh, for the it's relevant to coordination. While I will go for, uh, for, for card, maybe, Martin, I wanted to leave you with, with, if you can give us an example of this, an example of a country in this quadrant, but it's not only non-attribution, um, that managed to 
improve coordination that resulted into a high level of resilience and, and, and also reducing the criminality. I will come to you think about it. I will come to you as the last way just to give us a, a practical example that especially in the area of uh, security and justice. Uh, maybe it's a question that I guess a follow-up question, think about it, but let me go to Kat. Kat, let, let me turn to you, um, it's just very, maybe briefly. How, how do you think the linkages between security development and governance? You know, these are the terms sometimes that are used quite often, but sometimes it's very important to have a sense of it. How, how the, link, the linkage between security development governance play into the drivers of the transnational organized crime and the way that security and justice actors can coordinate responses to it? Uh, please, in a few minutes, six minutes. Yes, I won't, yeah. take, I won't take too much time because we want to leave a little more time here um, for interaction with the audience. But um, I've, we've mentioned a couple of these factors. There are three I would highlight, and we can discuss further um, throughout the weeks. But one is this issue of alternative livelihoods that has come up. Um, you know, not everybody... Um, not everybody in various communities that are affected by transnational organized crime would call all forms of trafficking and smuggling that we might be talking about here organized crime. They might consider these things um, elements of ways they can pursue uh, a livelihood. Um, and if there are no legal, um, you know, viable, uh, attractive alternatives to um, getting by and earning a livelihood on the community level here, um, uh, you, you may have um, increased challenges in relation to um, how you're dealing with transnational organized crime. So a key element of building resilience also relates to thinking about these alternative livelihoods. Another set of issues that are linked and we will discuss further um, along the weeks is state legitimacy and governance challenges. So for um, some of these efforts that we are trying to do to build resilience to really work and change things on the community level, people need to have trust in the state and in the laws and policies that the state is putting forward. And so sometimes in particular areas where either states are unable to reach or are not providing the level or the kinds of services um, that citizens expect as part of a social contract, this can pose some additional um, challenges to building up the kinds of relationships that one might need in order to have a resilient response um, that really sinks in and, and works over the long term. And then a third factor um, that's worth mentioning that Martin alluded to um, when he was discussing the ENACT index results is transparency and accountability of governments to citizens. So as the data and analysis on the index point out, sometimes it's the case that certain high level state officials can be colluding with the criminal networks that are very prevalent on the continent to facilitate crime. And so if because of that, the populace then comes to mistrust state responses to transnational organized crime, this can complicate um, our ability to build resilience as well. So uh, that can also complicate coordination. And so it's something to keep in mind because even then in that situation, even if we have coordination efforts by many well-intentioned state security and justice officials who are really committed to building resilience, this factor will still come into play as a potential thing um, that, that needs to be dealt with. So I'll leave it at that. Oh, well, thank you very much, Kat. Uh... Uh, let, let me really thank um, uh, Martin. I want that question on practical example during the uh, question and answer that you, you can just share later on because of so that can give time to the participant. But really, let me thank uh, on your behalf, uh, Martin and Kat, for sharing with us such a valuable information about the, the index, the organized crime index, and its relevance to coordination, resilient encountering transnational organized crime in Africa and particularly in the central, northern, and eastern African and the Horn of Africa. 